All right, well, <clears throat> this morning we're breaking into chapter 21. Uh, the first four verses have to do with that uh, gift of the widow, which is what we're going to be looking at, uh, and that will uh, certainly be uh, easy enough to understand. Uh, what we're going to be looking at beyond that, uh, we're getting into controversial ground, and would ask for your prayers as we would head into um, the destruction of Jerusalem, the things that Jesus speaks of next. Uh, it's prophetic, and we know there's a lot of different opinions on that. But let's begin by looking at these first four verses of chapter 21. Uh, we read in Luke's gospel, And he, that is Jesus, looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw a poor widow putting in two small copper coins. And he said, Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all of them, for they all out of their surplus put into the offering, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had to live on. Now let me just mention at the outset that uh, this account of the widow's offering is really in only two of the, uh, the four Gospels. And so uh, it's in Mark's Gospel as well as Luke's. We looked at it seven years ago when we were going through Mark's Gospel. Um, but I say that uh, to say that I'm going to be drawing from just the little extra bits that Mark includes as well as what we have in Luke. And it's not a lot more, but it gives us a little bit of insight. So this morning we see that Jesus turns to a subject that I think all of us would admit can sometimes be uncomfortable for us to think about and for us to talk about, and that is the, the subject of giving. And we're not talking here, and Jesus certainly isn't talking here, about the kind of giving that the health and wealth movement promotes, uh, giving so that God might make us rich. I mean, it, it's, it's easy to give, I suppose, if, if that's what you think is, is going to happen. You can't outgive God, and when you give, God will give back to you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Well, God does give back to us, but not exactly in that way. What Jesus is talking about here, and what we're going to be looking at, is giving from the heart. Giving that is motivated by love, that, that is really Christ-centered and not self-centered, that is meant to, to glorify Him and to promote His kingdom, and not necessarily our status in this world. Now, he reminds us in this text that, that when we do give with the proper motive, uh, we, we don't lose, but we will always gain. And I think sometimes we might be tempted to think, because we might be on the other end of the spectrum from the health and wealth movement, that by being overly generous, we might actually end up making things more difficult for ourselves, but nothing could really be farther from the truth. Our spiritual forefathers, the Puritans, strongly believed, and even wrote, that giving, far from bringing us to poverty, would actually lead to greater wealth, not only in this life, but also in the life to come. That if we were faithful to worship the Lord from the first of what He gives to us, what we call the first fruits of our increase, if we were to faithful to worship Him in our offerings, if we were faithful to worship Him in our charity uh, to the poor, that He would not only provide for us and our families here, and give to us the resources we need to continue to support His cause. Uh, he would also bless us with riches in heaven, the kind that our Lord Jesus tells us will not grow old and will not fall apart like the things of this world, and that no one will ever be able to take away from us. Now, last week, Jesus warned us about pride, and, and we don't want to forget that lesson either. He warned us against drawing attention to ourselves as the scribes who like to wear long robes, of wanting recognition for ourselves as the scribes, again, who liked respectful titles, of desiring places of honor for ourselves as the scribes who took the best seats in the synagogues and at banquets, of being thought more spiritual than others as the scribes who made lengthy prayers in public all the while, hypocritically, taking advantage of the most vulnerable in society, dragging widows to court 
for all they were worth. Jesus says, beware of their example. You know, if you and I can be tempted to compromise the truth, to compromise what we should be doing, when we see our brothers or sisters doing things they shouldn't be doing, how much more will we be tempted when we see those we look up to as spiritual leaders doing things they shouldn't be doing? Jesus says we need to be on our guard against them. Now, it's interesting that Jesus points out their, their greatest crime, which is taking advantage of the widow. And now he goes on to use a widow as an example of what we ought to be doing in the area of giving. Jesus now goes to where he can see the contributions being made, that he might draw his disciples' attention, that he might draw our attention to a poor widow to teach us something about giving. Now, this morning, I want us to look at five things from this text, and I'll tell you what those are now. First, the giving is a part of our Christian duty, a part of our stewardship that the Lord has entrusted to us. Secondly, that our Lord sees how we're doing. He sees <clears throat> what we're doing in this area. Uh, thirdly, that none of us are actually limited when it comes to giving. None of us are limited by what we have. Fourthly, that for this to be honoring to the Lord, we do need to give with the right motive. And then fifthly, that when we do give with the right motive, God will bless us for our sacrifice. Well, first of all, let's consider that giving is a part of our Christian duty, a part of our stewardship. Now, again, we've just read that Jesus was sitting opposite the treasury in order to watch the people give. Now, here's an interesting thing is uh, within that treasury itself, there wasn't just one box that a person might put their offering in. There were actually 13 such chests in the outer court of the temple, which is how Jesus could be in the temple area and see these things, each of them with a trumpet-shaped opening in which the Jews would place their offerings. Now, nine of these 13 boxes were for the required offerings of the law, uh, such as what was required uh, to accompany certain sacrifices, um, we know that when uh, Mary had uh, been cleansed of her impurity, that she had to make a sacrifice of uh, a couple of birds, and that indicated they were very poor. But there was also a certain monetary uh, uh, offering that went with that. It would be put into one of those, as well as offerings for the maintenance of the temple. And then there were four of these chests for voluntary offerings, those that the people would make purely to show their love and devotion to God. So we don't know exactly which was there, but perhaps because she wasn't necessarily there, we're not told she was there to make a sacrifice. It was very likely a voluntary offering to show her love for the Lord. Now, every Jew knew, and of course, every Christian knows as well, that as we have received everything that we have from God, that it all belongs to Him. And we already mentioned in prayer that uh, Jesus said we really can't be his disciples unless we have that recognition and are willing to yield all to him. And, and they also understood that they were to use what the Lord had given them in order to worship him. Now, the Jew knew this, of course, by way of example. Uh, there, there are certainly plenty of examples in the Old Testament. Let me give you a couple. Uh, when Abraham, or as he was known then at that time, Abram, heard that his nephew Lot had been taken captive by the four kings of the valley that had come out against the king of Sodom and Gomorrah and basically three other allies. He went out after them and rescued them with his small army of 318 trained uh, and armed men. And he was able to overcome them by God's grace. But before he attempted to return all the possessions that these kings had taken to the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah and the other kings with them, he first devoted a tenth of the spoils because, uh, because Abraham had basically conquered them. Uh, this wealth was now within his power. And so he devoted a tenth of this to God by giving it to Melchizedek. So here we see an example of, of giving and uh, giving for God's glory. And it happened to be a tenth. 
Now, when Jacob left his father's Isaac's house to seek a wife in Padam Aram, uh, he first of all made a vow. He made a promise to the Lord that if the Lord would bless his journey, that he would devote a tenth of all of his increase to him. We read in Genesis 28, 20 through 22, then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me on this journey that I take and will give me food to eat and garments to wear and I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. This stone which I've set up as a pillar will be God's house and of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Now, we see, well, again, the patriarchs, we see uh, Abraham and we see uh, Jacob both doing this even before there was any commandment with regard to giving. And the Jews understood this example, and I think they would see this commended to them. But if there was any question about that, they also uh, knew that this was God's will because he later commanded this when he established the Mosaic Covenant. He called his people to give him a tenth, what we call a tithe, of all that he blessed them with. We read in Leviticus 27, verse 30, all the tithe of the land, of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. You know, the Lord also essentially took out a tithe of people, you know, actually it started off with, with um, the firstborn of, of all the animals of Israel, but then he took the Levites instead, and those Levites he devoted to his particular work. Well, because the work of the Levite meant that uh, they were occupied essentially full time in the tabernacle and the temple, they didn't have time to go out and work the land and till the land and, and raise animals and so forth. So the Lord took this tithe that was devoted to him and he gave it to the Levites to support them and to take care of their need. Again, because there was no land inheritance for them. We read in Numbers 18 verse 21, to the sons of Levi, behold, I have given all the tithe in Israel for an inheritance in return for their service which they perform the service of the tent of meeting. Now, the Levites, remember, were a tribe. And within that tribe, there was also a more specialized class of person who were the priests. And they were the sons of Aaron. As the Levites received the tithe from the people of Israel, from all the other tribes, they were to give a tenth or a tithe of that tithe to support the priests. We read in Numbers 18, verses 26 and 28, the Lord says, Moreover, you shall speak to the Levites and say to them, When you take from the sons of Israel the tithe which I have given you from them for your inheritance, then you shall present an offering from it to the Lord, a tithe of the tithe. So you shall also present an offering to the Lord from your tithes, which you receive from the sons of Israel, and from it you shall give the Lord's offering to Aaron the priest. So the people made an offering to the Levites. It was actually to the Lord, and he gave it to the Levites. And then the Levites, in turn, made an offering to the Lord, and they gave that to the priests. And this is the way the work of God was supported, as those who had devoted themselves to that work had really no other means of support. Uh, this would be the, the way that they were supported. Now, when it comes to the new covenant, we see that God tells us that's essentially that we are to do the same thing. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 13 through 14, Do you not know that those who perform sacred services, again talking about Israel, eat the food of the temple, and those who attend regularly to the altar have their share from the altar? So also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. Uh, this is the reason why we, we still make offerings today, why we take up an offering uh, is because of this passage. This is the reason why we believe that when we send out missionaries uh, to do the work of the kingdom, to preach the gospel, that they shouldn't have to work to raise that money on their own, but rather the people of God should support them. Now, <clears throat> in the New Testament, he doesn't appear to give us any set amount 
as he did in the Old Covenant. Uh, so there's a variety of opinions on what we're supposed to be doing here. Some believe that he would still have us give a tenth. Uh, again, uh, since that seems to be the recurring example, since that was the command, since it almost seems as though God's people instinctively knew that that was the, the right amount. And by the way, I should mention too, there were other tithes that were given in Israel. There were other things, other, other uh, perhaps um, financial burdens <coughs> placed upon them to support the temple. Uh, there was a tithe taken to do that as well. There was a tithe that was given periodically to support the poor. There was also money given to support the king once that came in, into, um, once, they, once there was a king established in Israel. So there were other things, that, other ways in which they were required to give, but it seems like the tenth was always used to support the work of God. And so again, there are those who believe that that is still the appropriate amount. Uh, others believe that we should actually give more than a tenth because God has been so much more gracious in the new covenant. And they believe that a tithe, if we're able to give more than that, should really be a starting point, but not the end. While others believe that it's <clears throat> really entirely up to us, according to what the Lord has given to us, according to what we believe that we are able to give. Um, but again, whatever our position, I do think it is important that what we do, we do in faith. You know, what Paul writes regarding the ceremonial days, you know, which is something that, that in, well, in the new covenant may be observed or not observed as long as we... Uh, don't depend on that for our, you know, being accepted by God, by our, our being justified. Uh, what he says regarding those days, I think, could also apply to our giving, where he says this, each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. I think we don't just leave it to whatever we feel like on any particular occasion. We do need to come to grips with what the Lord would have us to give and make sure that we are giving in faith and being faithful in this. So we do believe that, that giving is a duty, a duty that our Lord enjoins on us and one that obviously should not be a burden to us because of the work that we're actually supporting, which is honoring to the Lord. But secondly, we need to be reminded that our Lord sees what we're doing in this area as well as in all areas. He sees how we're doing. We read in our text that Jesus looked up and he, he saw the rich as well as this poor widow putting their money into the treasury. Uh, and we assume, of course, and we know really that our Lord still sees us today. Now, sometimes you might think that because our Lord has, has gone into heaven and he's busy now governing all things to his holy ends and purposes, that he doesn't really have time to notice every little thing that we do. But actually the Lord does. He sees and He knows all these things. What David writes in Psalm 139 verses 1 through 4 does apply also to Jesus. You have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. Do you know that on the day of judgment that it is Jesus who's going to be sitting in judgment? And he says that on that day, every idle word that men have spoke will be brought up against them. Every thought, every sinful thought, every sinful desire, not just their actions. And of course, that applies to unbelievers and not to believers. But Jesus knows it all. Even though Jesus is united to our nature, even though He is fully man, and He had our limitations while He was here on earth, that doesn't mean that He still has those limitations in heaven. Apparently, His abilities have expanded to the point where He is able to direct everything that is going on in this world and in this universe to His desired ends. Remember, the government will rest upon His shoulders. So either his abilities in his humanity have increased or somehow his divine nature makes this possible. But either way, we know that Jesus is governing all things and sees all things and is going to hold everyone accountable for what they do. By the way, that doesn't apply just to the day of judgment. The Lord knows what we're doing right now. He also 
is one who loves us and who disciplines us so that we will do the right thing, but so he sees and he knows. And of course, as he looks and he sees what we're doing, he's either pleased by what he sees or he isn't pleased. And I think we understand that to be true, uh, something that uh, all Christians know, even if they don't apply this to Jesus, they know that God sees, right? The all-seeing eye, nothing is done in secret before Him. So knowing that that's true, we do need to make sure that we're being careful, being careful to remember that, that what we're doing is open to scrutiny. We need to make sure that we are loving the Lord. Uh, he's watching over us, and again, He's watching over us for our good, and He will do what is necessary to get us to move into the right direction, not just in this area, but really in, in every area of our lives. The Lord sees us. Okay, well, thirdly, we should be encouraged uh, that when it comes to the matter of giving, it doesn't matter how much we have. We can have a lot or we can have a little, and we can still do what is pleasing to the Lord. As He sees, you know, again, what we're doing, we can please Him. Now, as Jesus watched, He saw the rich making <clears throat> large contributions, remember. But He also saw a poor widow putting in two small copper coins, which Mark tells us amounted to one cent. Now, again, what does that mean? It, it's uh, kind of hard to correlate it with what uh, we know about finances today, but a cent in those days was about one sixty-fourth of a denarius, and a denarius was the wage that a common worker would make for a day's labor. Okay, so perhaps we could calculate what the average uh, laborer would make today in a day and then figure out what one sixty-fourth of that might be. I don't know, if he made $64, it would be uh, a dollar, okay? So she had a dollar. Uh, but he, as he sees the widow putting this in, and again, it was a very small amount, he then called his disciples, and he pointed her out, and he said to them, truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all of them. Now, that can be interpreted in two different ways. He meant either that she put in more than any one of them or she put in more than all of them combined. And I think it really means all of them combined. Now, how could that be since she clearly put in much less than they did? Well, he continues in verse 4, For they all out of their surplus put into the offering, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had to live on. When they finished giving, they still had plenty left over and all their needs were met. But she had nothing left over. She put in everything that she had. Now, what this tells us is that the Lord does not measure our giving merely by the amount of money that we give, but He measures it by how much, uh, we, ha how much we give in relation to how much we have. Uh, an example of this might be that, you know, that a person can give $100,000, and, and that would seem, I think, to, to most of us like a lot, like a large contribution, but if that person has a billion dollars to begin with, then it isn't very much to the Lord because $100,000 in comparison is only one one-hundredth of one percent of what that person has. In other words, it's like one ten-thousandth of, of what that person has. That billion dollars is a lot of money. But a one-cent contribution would be much greater to him if the person giving it only has one cent because that's 100% of, of what they have. Or, or this widow is essentially giving 10,000% more than the person who gives the $100,000 if they possess a billion dollars. If we have little and so give little, the Lord will count it as more because it is a greater sacrifice. You see, we don't need to have a lot in order to be able to give a lot. Uh, it just it matters on really the, how much we give to the Lord. But there's something else that's involved in this giving that we don't want <coughs> to miss. 
for it to count. Uh, as anything that, that is meaningful to the Lord at all, it needs to be given with the right motive. Now, we were reminded in the introduction that people give to God for a variety of reasons. Uh, some give because they believe that if they give to the Lord, the Lord's going to give back, that the Lord is going to make them rich. And they would look at this widow's offering, you might even hear a sermon on this from them, as an attempt to do exactly that. She gave in order to become rich. She knew that if she would just sort of plant the seed, that God would water it and make it grow. But let me submit to you that Jesus would not have drawn his attention, his disciples' attention to her if that's what she was after, if it was purely from selfishness or self-interest. Let's not forget what Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6.10, for the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Um, Self-interest, greed, avarice, this is not something that, that the Lord would, would bless. It's something He actually warns us against. Jesus would not have drawn their attention to her if that's what she was after, but He would if she had done this from faith, from the kind of faith that works by love because she really wanted to honor God. We need to make sure that when we give, that we give from the heart, that we give because we love the Lord, that we give because we want to see His work move forward, because that's the thing that is most important to us. Paul tells us that anything we do for the Lord, if it isn't motivated by love, it will not be accepted. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 3, doesn't matter if we have the greatest gifts, doesn't matter if we make the greatest sacrifices. Even if we become martyrs, if it is not done out of love, it is meaningless to him. This widow loved the Lord, and that's why she gave. And finally, we need to believe that God will bless us if we do make these sacrifices. Now, this widow gave everything that she had, all the money she had for food on that particular day. It wouldn't be a stretch to believe that she did this not thinking that now I'm going to be destitute and I'm going to die, but she did this trusting that the Lord was actually going to take care of her because that is what God says He will actually do for us. Now, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 through 9, Now this I say, He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. As it is written, he scattered abroad, he gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. The Lord tells us here that w the Lord will actually give to us as, as we have given to him if we sow sparingly, if we give to his work sparingly, if we give to the poor sparingly, uh, we will also reap sparingly. But if we sow bountifully, then we will reap bountifully. Now that applies, he says, in this life that God will make all grace abound to us so that we will always have a sufficiency, which means enough, in everything, in abundance, he says, for every good deed. So we can expect to receive something back in this life. But again, let's remember, we're not giving to get. Giving still needs to be from a pure motive. It needs to be for the glory of God and love for Him and not just so that we will get rich. God will bless us if we give. But he also says that he will reward us in our giving in the life which is to come. Jesus says, remember in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, verses 16 through 21, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. 
For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now notice Jesus is saying a couple of things here. If your treasures are on earth, your heart will be here. And if your heart is here, then obviously you're going to perish with your riches, right? Because that's not the heart of any true believer. But if your heart is in heaven, that's where you'll want your riches to be. And so you'll use what you have for that. Well, it's by using what God gives us in the world here that for His glory, that's how we store up riches in heaven. And that's how we need to be thinking about these things, about what God gives us. It was because of what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount that Joseph Hall, by the way, if you've ever read much about uh, George Whitfield, you know that he really loved Hall's contemplations. Well, Joseph Hall was a bishop in the Church of England. He lived in the late 16th, uh, early 17th century. He reminds us that giving is really the best investment that we can possibly make based upon what Jesus says here. This is what he writes in his contemplations. Christianity teaches me that what I charitably give alive, I carry with me dead. And experience teaches me that what I leave behind, I lose. I will carry that treasure with me by giving it, which the worldling loses by keeping it so that while his corpse shall carry nothing but a winding cloth to the grave, I shall be richer under the earth than I was above it. Now again, he doesn't mean our our riches are going to be buried with our corpse, but what he means is that um, while our body is in the grave, that, that still belongs to us, that's still me, but my soul's in heaven, and I'll be rich there, but certainly in the new heavens and the new earth when those two are combined. I will have there everything that I have given here. Okay, that's why we need to think about putting the Lord first and why we need to think about giving, um, giving to His work, giving. uh, Again, His work means not only the work of the ministry, but it certainly also means giving to the poor. Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount that if we will do that, if we will... um, seek His kingdom first and put it first in our lives in this way that we don't need to worry like everyone else about where our needs are going to, how our needs are going to be met, where those things are going to come from because the Lord says He will take care of us. This, this poor widow put in everything she had, but she put it in knowing that that was the case, knowing that God was going to provide for her and knowing that what He was going to provide was going to be more than the two small copper coins that she was investing. Now, sometimes we struggle financially, and the reason could be because the Lord is testing us. Certainly, that's true, but sometimes it could also be because we're not giving as much as we ought to be giving. It's because we're, we're giving too little. Listen again to what Solomon writes, what we read in our uh, meditation. Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. You know, when Elijah came to the widow of Zarephath during the famine, remember? She only had a handful of flour and a little bit of oil in a jar and she was about to make a little bread cake for herself and for her son. She was expecting to eat it and then to die. Well, then when Elijah came to her, he said, Make me a cake first, and then you can make one for you and your son. And he says, because this is what the Lord says, if you will do this, the Lord will make sure that little bit of flour and that little bit of oil will provide for you through the famine. And you know what? She did exactly that. She made Elijah the cake, gave that to the Lord essentially first, to his servant, and then she made one for herself and her son. And all during the time of the famine, the Lord sustained her on that little bit of flour and that little bit of oil because the Lord is faithful. You know, there are stories in church history about this, certainly the same thing. Think about George Mueller and how he relied on the Lord to take care of him and the needs of, of the many orphans and how many thousands of orphans he was able to take care of because he trusted that the Lord would provide. He gave everything to Him. If we put the Lord first in our giving, if we 
remember his work, the church, if we think about the work of evangelism and missions, if we think about the, those who are needy, who belong to him, if we think about the poor, even who are outside the church, and if we are faithful to, to help them, we can't take care of all poverty, certainly that's true, but it's also true that we can do more than we are doing. If we do this, the Lord says that He will also take care of us. So we need to think about that and think about what our obligations are, what our duties are, what, what love dictates, and look around and see what we might be able to do for the Lord's glory, remembering that it is true we can never outgive God. And it's also true that whatever we give to Him here, we will carry out of this world. So let's pray that the Lord will give us the grace of giving, even as He gave this poor widow. Well, let's, uh, let's take just a moment, shall we, and bow in silent prayer. And let's ask the Lord to show us how we might respond to this.